Hello everybody, it's Factory Friday and I'm here to answer all your questions, so let's get straight into it. It's an unusual season, loads and loads of triple headers this year, and it is especially difficult to get updates to the car in the middle of a triple header. So generally we try to avoid that. We try to time the upgrades so that they arrive in between these these concentrated blasts of racing. You can do it, but it's very, very difficult. Because the regulations change in 2021 to forbid DAS, it follows that you don't actually have to spend a token to remove it because that would simply be unfair. So no, no token spend needed, just something we have to take off our car and replace with a conventional steering for next year. We sort of take engineering uh, academic ProS for granted in F1. All the people who join us as engineers have got that tucked away. The most valuable thing I think you can do alongside the academic stuff if you're planning to be an engineer is learn how to be good at working with other people. There are some aspects of engineering that are lone wolfy type activities, but nearly all of it involves working in teams, collaborating with other engineers, bringing together your work into something that you couldn't possibly do on your own. So I'd encourage you to go out, get involved in, in clubs, in activities which require you to, to be good at interacting with other people because that's an extremely useful training ground for, for the discipline of engineering. I'm often asked what is the most important thing we've done or the most innovative thing we've done. Uh, and it's a difficult question to answer, a frustrating question in some ways because it, it's not really a fair reflection of the challenge of creating a Formula One car. Because the challenge is make the fastest car you possibly can with the team you have. And the team is not just the engineers or the people that race the car, it's the entire team. The whole, the whole engine of people that, that come together to create the car. And no single part of it really is any more important than any other part of it. All of them add together hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small things technically and thousands of things across the full gamut of the team to allow us to put a car on the track on a Sunday that can go and do, uh, we hope, better than our opponents. And there is just, it's just impossible to start picking and choosing what the most important thing is. All of it has to work. All of it has to be strong and all of us can take combined pleasure when we get it right because we know it's the, it's the input of all of us that has created this. The race team is set up so that it can be completely autonomous. The, the rest of the world could, could fall away and be cut off, the, all the phone lines go down, the computer networks break, the race team can keep operating. It's fundamental to have that resilience to be able to keep the car around the track irrespective of what happens in the outside world. But they are linked to the factory. They do rely on the factory uh, to help them, but everything the factory can contribute via the race support room and the live links that we have from the factory is a bonus. It improves and multiplies our power and our decision-making capability at the track, but if it all gets cut away, we can keep going with the local people and the local networks running the car at the track. There is no such thing as the best design choice uh, on the car. I guess if God were to descend from on high and design a Formula One car, then, then God could make the best Formula One car. He could make the perfect decisions. But for, for mere mortals, all we can do is hope to improve on, the, on, on, on our current best so far. So the task of engineering is not so much to choose the best, it's to make the most improvement that you can before the deadline arrives at which you have to commit to building it and putting it on the track. And to do that, you have to try to organize yourself with an engineering structure and a decision-making process back at the factory that understands the objectives, has a way of measuring what the new component is performing like compared with your objective and then you pick the best one that you have at the time when you have to commit. Although Mugello is a new venue for Grand Prix racing, it doesn't mean it's going to be a completely impossible experience for either the team or the drivers. 
Several of the drivers have actually driven there before in testing and the teams in any case have got a lot of information about the circuit so we can run it in simulation and then the drivers can run it on our factory simulators. So by the time we get there we already know an awful lot about it just as we do at other circuits which are brand new for the year. And after a few laps the drivers are going to be driving around the racing line as if they've as if they've been there all their lives. It's one of the things they're freakishly good at. The regulations prevent us from working on the aerodynamics of the 2022 car uh, until the start of next year, start of 2021. But that doesn't mean we can't work on the 2022 project at all. The regulations have been published and there's plenty of challenges that are not aerodynamic challenges that we are working on. We've been working on them for months, we'll keep working on them all the way through this year and then when the calendar rolls round to 2021 they'll be joined by the main thrust of the effort which will be the aerodynamic programme. Formula One is an open series, uh, an open cockpit racing series and that means that all the air that goes past the, uh, the cockpit would go onto the driver's helmet if we didn't have that little windscreen. If we didn't have that little windscreen then that air at the end of the straight moving fast as it is would act on the helmet lifting the helmet off the driver's head and pulling the helmet up against his neck. It would be a bit dangerous and it's also very very uncomfortable. By putting that little windscreen strip in we create an aerodynamic trip for the air. It causes the air to separate off the top of the screen and all the fast air will go up and above the driver's head and reattach somewhere behind his helmet on the headrest. And beneath that trip, you end up with air that's moving quite slowly. So he has, although it's only tiny, he's, he's got an area where he can move his head that's not really in the full force of the wind. Why do we have the zigzags on the screen? Well, it's a small effect, but that zigzag effect just means that the boundary between the fast moving air that we've thrown up above his head and the slow moving air where he's moving his, his helmet from left to right as he drives, the boundary between those fast and slow moving airs is just blurred out a little bit and softened by the effect of those zigzags, meaning we can, uh, we, we've got a bit of margin for error if we don't quite position this, uh, uh, this fast moving air exactly where we expected it to be, then uh, we just have a soft transition to the slow moving air that just gives us a slightly, a slightly more forgiving arrangement. The sensor issue we had in the first Austrian race was a really scary one. We finished that weekend hanging on by the very tips of our fingernails. It was uh, not a comfortable experience at all. And it wasn't comfortable because we knew on the Friday we were in deep trouble. And so from that Friday of the first Austrian race, there was already an awful lot of work going on back at the factory to, I, to try to understand what it was that was letting us down in the front end of the gearbox. Lots and lots of work to understand where the cable uh, was uh, vibrating and why that cable was breaking as a consequence of that vibration. It was an awful lot of work with both the electronic designers, with the people that then are able to do rig testing of gearboxes so that we could run it on our factory back here uh, and check that the fix worked, and for the people who had to manufacture the new looms and new, uh, new cable boots and new connector boots so we could get them back out to the track. That work started on the Friday of the first Austria. The design was probably completed by midway through Monday. We were making bits on the Tuesday. We delivered them by the Wednesday and we were testing them on Thursday so we could just stay a small whisker ahead of the track running uh, for the second Austria. It was a big scary thing, lots and lots of people involved and, uh, and lots of sleepless nights. Thank you everybody for sending in all your questions and we'll be back for another Factory Friday very soon. <laughs>